this lecture is being in support of uh, Mariposa Montessori School, which is where we are. Um, the school wants to buy land that would be like really ideal and then build a new campus on it. And it's trying to come up with the money for the bank loan. We, they need a certain amount. And so I agreed to do some lectures, hoping to get some donations. Um, the first, or this is the second lecture. This one is the rise of Islam. The, the topics, I, I, if I remember correctly, I picked 11 and then I had people vote on what topics to do. And this was one of the topics that people picked. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be covering a, kind of a broad period of time. What I want to do is kind of give an overview over the first uh, seven centuries of Islamic history. And as a result, that means that I'm not going to, I'm going to try to avoid doing too many detailed events, but I, I have to do a few just because it's just too painful to skip them, um, especially because it'll give a feel for what happened. Having said that, I've actually spent the last three days uh, doing interviews with the local news agencies about ISIL, and I just want to say right now that I refuse to bring them into this talk. If, if, if people want, I can do a talk later on down the road about ISIL. Um, I just don't want to give them the, the pleasure of another victory. Um, in any case, so let me, let me start. And what I want to do to start is I want to actually give you uh, the backdrop. I, one of the things that's always driven me nuts about it, talking about historical moments like this is missing the context. So um, the backdrop for this is really, really starts in the uh, 5th century AD. And what happens is a non-event, right? There was a, an event that took place in 476 AD. Really, I, I should, I, now that I've said this, I, I really want to back up just a little bit. Um, there was an event that took place in 391 AD that was probably the trigger that sort of sets the whole thing rolling. And what this event was, <coughs> was the burning of the Library of Alexandria. The Archbishop of Alexandria, a man named Theophilus, decided that one way he could deal with the constant uh, Egyptian uprisings, Egypt had been conquered by the Roman Empire in 30 BC, and had been an incredibly important part of the Roman Empire, but it never settled into its role as part of the Roman Empire. Um, the Battle of Actium that took place in 30 BC um, between Cleopatra, the famous naval battle between Cleopatra and Marcus Antony on one side and uh, Augustus Caesar on the other side. That, that battle was actually a battle to decide who would be the next empire, whether it would be Egypt with Rome as sort of a subservient force, or whether it would be Rome with Egypt as a conquered territory, crushed and forced into the empire. And ultimately, it ended up being, you know, Egypt lost, mostly because um, Marcus Antony and Cleopatra were incompetent. But the result, the ultimate positive result for the Roman Empire was that they ended up with Alexandria. Alexandria, at its heyday, uh, reached around a million people in population. It was a major <coughs> trade outpost. Goods that the Roman Empire w wanted to send to Asia, to India, to China, went through Alexandria, went through Egypt. Um, Egypt was the breadbasket for the Roman Empire. It was one province, but it probably produced somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of all the wheat in the Roman Empire. So without, without Egyptian grain, the, the Romans couldn't maintain their legions in the fields. Um, <clears throat> but there was this other really amazing bonus to, to Alexandria, and it was the library. The great library, <clears throat> it sounds like it was just a building filled with books. It was a little bit more. The Great Library is the world's first ever research university. It, and, and I mean it in the truest sense of the word, as in it wanted to study every single topic that existed. Um, prior to the Great Library, there were colleges or academies, right? The, the Academy of Athens that you know, Plato was a part of, for example. The, probably the world's first ever full-fledged academy was founded in the Old, old Kingdom Egypt um, 4,800 years ago or so, and it was a medical academy. Um, what, I, what I mean by the Great Library being a university is it didn't just study one topic. So the medical academy did medicine. 
but you did medicine at the Great Library if you wanted to, but you could also invent things like ge geometry. Um, you could invent things like the world's first ever robot. It was steam powered. The uh, f world's first ever analog mechanical play that was run by steam power. Um, they <coughs> created star charts. They figured out the size of the Earth. They not only knew the Earth was a sphere, they actually figured out its circumference at the equator. They were off by 1%. They were 99% accurate. Um, so Alexandria ends up becoming this really important place, and the Great Library ends up becoming this place for enormous thinking and development and innovation, which is really good for the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire, contrary to popular belief, was terrible at innovating. Uh, you've probably been taught that the Romans invented roads. That's nonsense. It's just, it's beyond nonsense. The uh, roads were invented about 2,000 years before the city of Rome was even founded. And by roads, I'm assuming people mean paved roads, because obviously the first ever road was the first time anybody walked from point A to point B multiple times and created a path in the ground. But, but if you mean paved road, then the first paved road was invented in Egypt uh, about 2,000 years before the founding of the city of Rome. The Romans, <coughs> what they were really good at was conquering. They, they, they were a machine, a war machine, a, a really amazing, finely tuned war machine. Roman soldiers did uh, mu multiple decades tours of duty. It depends on what time period you're talking about. You know, by the 6th century uh, AD, the foot soldiers, the infantry, were doing 25-year tours of duty. And then if you wanted to, you could sign up for another 25 years if you were still alive. Um, and then you know, cavalry did 24 years. <coughs> um, and what these Roman soldiers were trained to do was they were engineers. They could, during the night, they could build, after they'd stopped marching, they could build a fort in, basically with no light. They could cut down the trees, make a fort, sleep in it, and then in the morning they would pack their goods up, set the fort on fire, and move to the next location. And <coughs> this is the way they operated. The Roman Empire thrived in part because of its conquest of the Great Library because that place could do the innovating it couldn't do otherwise. The Romans were great thieves. Um, when they conquered France, for example, Gaul, they ended up absorbing all this technology, me metallurgy, for example. Uh, Roman, Roman metallurgy was really behind until they conquered Gaul. And so they could, they, they could either absorb <coughs> technology through conquest or through the innovations of the Great Library. In 391 AD, the now or the then Christian Roman Empire decided that it wanted to purge its city of its non-Christians. The city was about a quarter pagan and it was about a quarter Jewish. <clears throat> so Theophilus, the Archbishop of Alexandria, ordered that the pagan and Jewish population be expelled or or killed, that it be gotten rid of. Um, a, a mob of Christians formed, they went to the Jewish parts of the, t of the city, and they began attacking Jewish businesses as, uh, uh, and Jewish homes. As the Jewish population realized that they were in trouble, uh, some of them began to flee towards the ports. They just realized they had to get out of the city. Uh, others ran to synagogues, thinking that it would be a, a way to escape. You know, surely they won't attack at the synagogues. Uh, the Christians <coughs> attacked the synagogues. One thing they would do is they would throw stones through the windows and they basically stoned the population inside. At other synagogues, they just set them on fire and burned everybody alive inside. Um, as this was happening, the pagan population began to get a little, a little worried. Um, so they, many of them be, preemptively began running towards the port to just see if they could get, a, get out of the city. As soon, a, after the Jews were done, uh, the Christian mob then went to the pagans and began attacking them as well. Well, the Great Library was like the bastion of paganism. It was a massive complex for its time. It, it was walled off, and there was a big wooden uh, gate on the front. Um, when the mob arrived, the, the, they knew to keep the gate closed, but they had brought a battering ram, so they knew that things weren't going to end well. The director was a woman named Hypatia. Um, in Egypt, women had enormous rights. R Rome, women were basically slaves. Um, if, if you sat an ancient Roman down with a member of the Taliban and had them have a conversation about how they treated their women, the Taliban would be horrified. He would think, oh my god, I can't believe you're so vicious to your women. 
Um, by the way, did I, we're, that founding civilization we base ourselves on is that Rome, not the Taliban. Just, just thought I'd <laughs> remind everybody. Hypatia was a director. Um, when Rome absorbed Egypt, um, by the way, I can't stress this enough. Uh, having studied ancient civilizations and done a little bit of comparing, uh, the Celts were good with their women. They weren't great, but the women had enormous opportunity. Like women could become business leaders, uh, women could take political positions, there were possibilities. The Egyptians, there were women queens who ruled in and of their own right. There were some women who took on the title pharaoh. Um, there, were, there were women in, who were the directors of the, the medical academy that I was talking about earlier. There were women who were the directors of the great library. When Rome took over, they said no more of that. Women can't do all this stuff, it's just not right. For, and they basically tried to get women out of business. So what Egyptian women did was they would take a slave, a male slave, and they would take the male slave with them when they had to sign a contract, because under Roman law, a woman couldn't sign a contract. And they would have the male slave sign the contract, even though everyone knew it was the woman who was running the show and that that guy was just a slave. And this is how they kind of circumvented Roman law. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's a mixture of religions. So, um, for example, the god Serapis was, um, he was a construct god. He was a, they, they made him up when the Greeks took over Egypt. Um, I don't know if it was Ptolemy the first or, or the, the ruler before him who, who made Serapis, but it was a combination of two gods, um, Ausar, known in Greek as Osiris, and then Apis, or happy in, e in, in Egyptian, but Apis. In, and so they took Osiris, Apis, and that became Serapis. They just sort of merged them together. And they made this new god that the Greeks then associated with Hades, and he became the patron god of, of Alexandria. Um, he, I don't really think he fits Hades very well. Osiris was the god of rebirth. Hades is the underworld, but that's what the Greeks did. They associated him with Hades. Um, so there was... You, you could, in Alexandria, find people who were worshipping the Greek pantheon. You could find people who were worshipping the Roman pantheon, which had a lot of overlap. Um, and then you would have found people worshipping the ancient Egyptian pantheon. And then these hybrid gods, which is, you know, even though he's a merger of two Egyptian gods, he was, it was, that merger was done by Greeks. So it's totally a, a, a merger of Greek and Egyptian culture at that point. Um, but yeah, there, these pagans are worshipping these pantheons or some portion of it. Um, the Isis cult had spread throughout the Roman Empire before Rome Christianized. What, what was the impetus to go after the Jews and the pagans by the Christians? So there's a couple of, re a couple of things that are going on. One is Egypt is in a constant state of foment. And what Theophilus thinks is if I can get Egyptian population to hate Jews and pagans and sort of purge them out of the city in the process, I can, I can get rid of my enemies, the Jews and the pagans, but at the same time I can get the, the Egyptian population to stop hating Rome and hate somebody else. So he's trying to redirect. He's trying to get their anger focused on somebody else. That, and he has a problem. Um, you know, now we cherry pick Christianity. We just ignore parts of the Bible we, we find inconvenient and move on. At the time, they, they weren't ready to do that. And it's very clear in pa Paul's writings that women are not supposed to be leaders and that women are not supposed to be teachers. And there's Hypatia, the, the director of the world's most powerful uh, intellectual institution. Um, at, the, at its height, the Great Library had around a million books. It, you know, it was a research Institute. It had the world's first ever museum. In fact, that's where we get the word museum from. And they, they would show their inventions. They would show off their achievements in this, and it, you know, but now we think of it as a place where you just go look at the, at the past. But for them, it was the present. Um, he, he wants to get rid of her position because it's just really weird. It's, it's in the face of Christian, Christianity's teaching about what women's limitations should be. And so, he, uh, so when she realizes that the mob has arrived outside of the great library, she grabs her students. He goes, follow me. And she goes to other classes that are still in session. 
She goes, come, we gotta go. And they ran to the library part of the great library. And she just ran along the bookshelves and looked at the titles of the books. And all the books she thought were the most valuable, she just threw them on the floor. And the students would run up behind her and scoop the books up and they would tuck it in their clothing or hold it however they could. And they ran out the back of the great library and they went to her home and they deposited uh, a few hundred books. Uh, we don't know exactly how many out of the million or so books. And then the Christians with the battering ram smashed the gates open and then burned the library to the ground and wiped out uh, centuries of, of human knowledge and development. Um, that, that was catastrophic for the Roman Empire. It, it, it set the stage for Rome's decline because they just lost their, it was just their brain basically. They, no way to innovate anymore. So now that the great library is out of the picture, there are some attempts, the, the academy in Athens has started back up again. There are some attempts to sort of save the day. Um, by the way, Hypatia's story isn't over. Let me finish Hypatia's story. Um, in 415, the Archbishop Carolus uh, orders that Hypatia go ahead, that they get rid of her. Uh, she can't be a director of a great institution anymore because it's gone, but she began tutoring. And people from all over the Roman Empire would send their kids to, because she was, she was brilliant. She was a Neoplatonist. She wrote at least two books that I know of. Um, she co-wrote them actually with her dad. Uh, she was on the verge of figuring out how to prove that the Earth was not at the center of the solar system, that the Sun was. Uh, she was working on a heliocentric model. Uh, she was having a little bit of trouble getting that last little bit, but she's still working at this, trying to figure out how to prove it. She knew that there was a um, Greek uh, named Ptolemaeus, and Ptolemaeus had shown that the Earth was in fact at the center of the solar system, and he had actually created a mechanical model for it. But to make it work, the planets, appear to move in the sky, right? And so to make it work, he had to create this really weird gear mechanism and it, it didn't quite do it. It came close, but it wasn't quite right. And so Hypatia knew that he was wrong, that it really was the sun at the center and she was trying to prove it. In 415, uh, she was riding, she rode a white, white horse. She was riding home or she was riding to the store or s coming back. Anyway, monks found her, they grabbed her, they pulled her off of her horse and they took seashells, they had brought seashells with them, and they scraped the flesh from her bones. And as she's screaming, as the skin and muscle tissue are being torn from her, um, a mob had formed around and were watching this, and they reached in and they grabbed her, and when they did, she just, by that point, she had already lost so much of her flesh that she just sort of came apart. And that's how Hypatia ends. Um, then they went and burned her home and finished off the books. So in case you were thinking that some of those books were going to make it, they don't. It's their thorough. They took her body parts outside of the city and set them on fire. So she was just sort of eradicated. And her legacy is lost. Right around the same time period, in 400, a group of Germanic tribesmen approach the Roman frontier and they breach it. They're called the Vandals. And they go all the way to what is now the southern tip of Spain, and they just park, carve it out, and go, this is ours now. And Rome couldn't get them back out. So that, in many ways, the year 400 is sort of the marker when, okay, Rome's no longer the amazing empire it once was. They've just been invaded. Somebody's gone right into their empire and carved a chunk of it off. Well, to, different. well, yeah, the Vandals were one of the barbarian groups. Uh, just, multiple... Anybody, anybody who wasn't a Roman was a, was a barbarian. So if you were Greek, you were a barbarian. Right. Yeah, and it was because, you know, when, you, when they heard you talk, it sounded like you were going bar, 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 bar. And that's where the word, that's how the, where the word comes from. By the way, the word Berber is actually uh, that. That was originally barbarian. So um, it's... As in the, As in the people in North Africa, the Berbers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. The people <laughs> and the people got named barbarian. Everybody did, but it stuck with them. Roman. Yeah, right. It just meant non-Roman. Yeah, and we now think of it as oh, you know, drooling, toothless, crazy. Um, now, so let me jump now to 476. What happens in 476? I'll even give you the date. It's September 4th. 
is the Western Roman Empire's Senate. So the, the Roman Empire has been split into two. There's an East and a West. There's two Senates and two Emperors. That's actually an oversimplification. There's really four emperors, but uh, there's like a, a primary, two primary emperors and then two secondary emperors. Um, and they did this so that they could better administer the empire. The empire was just too complicated to rule otherwise. The, another Germanic group called the Ostrogoths, they were actually part of the Goths, and then they split into two groups. The Visigoths went and invaded Spain, and the Ostrogoths stay in Italy. The Ostrogoths had basically conquered Italy, and the Western Roman Senate got together with the um, Germanic tribesmen, the, the king of the Ostrogoths, his name was Odoacer, and said, look, we, we want to make a deal. And the deal was that Odoacer would become the first king of Italy, that Italy would still be part of the Roman Empire. This is their home, right? This is, the city of Rome is in Italy. They're losing Italy. It would, it would be like if the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland lost England. It would be really weird. <laughs> like, well, you know, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland are still hanging in there, but England's gone. Um, so there's this identity crisis moment, and the Western Senate, which still exists, is still functioning, votes to disband the Western Emperor. They go, we don't need him anymore. We got the King of Italy, this, this Ostrogoth. They take his robe... They take the Western Roman Emperor's robe, they put it in a box, and they send it with a letter explaining what they've done, that they've, got, they've dissolved the Western Emperor to Constantinople, which is the other capital of the empire. Um, when the emperor, his name is Zeno, when he receives the, the robe, he accepts. He accepts that the, the Western Roman Emperor's name was Romulus Augustus. He accepts that he's no longer emperor. But he convinces Odoacer to keep a Western Roman emperor around, and he's just a symbolic figure. For some reason, everybody says this is when the Roman Empire collapsed. This is just wrong. It's not even in, a, in any way close to the truth. What happened was Rome had two capitals, two emperors. They got rid of one of the emperors. They got rid of one of the capitals. They didn't go away. They just tr changed the, the configuration, the political configuration. But, having said that, it is a painful thing to lose Italy. And, it, and it, most of what was the Western Roman Empire is falling to these Germanic tribesmen. Eventually, um, as the Visigoths invade Spain, the Vandals who are in Spain panic because they, they know they're going to get conquered by the Visigoths, so they invade North Africa. So the Vandals own North Africa, these Germanic tribesmen own North Africa, the Visigoths have Spain, the Ostrogoths have Italy, the Franks have Gaul, hence its new name France, right? named after the Franks who are Germanic tribesmen. And, so, and then, of course, the Anglos and the Saxons have big chunk of Britain and they name part of that after the Anglos and it becomes Angloland, which over time just becomes England. And so this painful loss of the West happens, but it doesn't mean that the Roman Empire has collapsed. In um, subsequent years, there's actually two, two periods. In 535, Rome reinvades Italy and tries to take it and put it back into the empire. Uh, they, they actually conquer most of Italy, but they have to withdraw because the Persians have attacked and they need those men out of Italy and back into Syria where they can fight the Persians. So they basically put off conquering Italy. They re-attack Italy again in 551 and they conquer. They get it. They get Italy back again. It takes them about 17 years to do it. But just as they're finishing, another Germanic tribe called the Lombards invade Italy and they can't stand up to the Lombards. They don't have the men. They're outnumbered nine to one. And the Lombards capture about half of Italy instantaneously. Now, the reason I'm telling all this is I want you to see that Rome is weak. Rome is having problems. It's, it's lost huge chunks of really valuable territory. It's not doing really well. But it's still there, and it's still in the fight, and its soldiers are still amazing. And it, and it, you know, it still has Constantinople. It still has Alexandria, even though it's missing the Great Library. It's still in the fight. In 541, right around the same time period as trying to reconquer Italy, uh, there's an outbreak of the bubonic plague. And I know all of you th are thinking of the 1347 outbreak. That was a different outbreak. Uh, it happened eight centuries later. This is, the 541 outbreak was devastating. It lasted about two years, like the 537, 540, I'm sorry, 1347, 1348 outbreak. 
They both last about two years. And they both had similar uh, percentage death rates. In the, the first outbreak, or this outbreak, because there was, there was actually at least one pre, prior to this, um, the 541 outbreak is called Justinian's Plague. It, about 40% of the empire died, just phew, gone. Um, the 1347 outbreak, everybody always talks about about a quarter of Europe dies. That's true, but about half of the Arab world dies in that one. So these are really devastating events. Um, Rome, so Rome is sitting here trying to recover from this. It's fighting the Germanic tribesmen in the west. It's fighting the Persians in the east. And then it, it gets into this really bad, this really strange situation. It gets this emperor, his name is Mauritius, or Emperor Maurice. I just have a hard time calling him Maurice. I'm going to go with Mauritius. Emperor Mauritius is, is a great emperor. He um, defeats the Persians. He get, for Rome fought, the Roman Empire fought the Persian Empire for about 700 years. Uh, you know, they would fight and then stop and fight and stop. And for about 600 of that 700 years, Rome paid Persia a price to not be attacked. They would just send them, I don't remember how many pounds of gold every year. And it's like, just please don't fight us because you'll defeat us again. And so Mauritius actually ends that. Um, Rome no longer has to pay Persia. Um, he reorganizes the western parts of the empire. He creates the exarch, the exarchate of Ravenna, the exarchate of um, Africa. And his goal in doing that is to make it so that the western part of the empire can kind of fight for itself and doesn't need his supervision. He reconquers the Balkans. He uh, ends up with a big chunk of Armenia. He actually takes people and colonizes, recolonizes the Balkans. Things are looking kind of great. And then something really strange happens. In all of his struggle, one thing he, he's never been able to battle is having revenue. He just doesn't have the tax revenue. So he's doing all these really amazing things, but he's doing it on the fly with no money. He has 12,000 men in the Danube. They get captured by a group of uh, people called the Avars. The Avars were from Eastern Asia. Uh, they migrated to Europe via India. And they, when they were in India, they picked up the stirrup and they brought the stirrup back with them and um, used or transmitted the stirrup to Europe. That's where Europeans got the stirrup from, was from the Avars. Um, if you see art from art depicting the soldiers of the time period, and you see, you'll, you'll see very Asiatic looking soldiers in the Roman army. Those are more than likely Avars, although they could be Huns, because um, the Huns were also from Eastern Europe. Anyway, there, he's fighting the Avars in what is now Hungary, uh, Romania, Croatia area. And they capture 12,000 of his men, and they ask for a ransom. They go, we'll give them all back to you. You just got to pay us some money. And you go, I don't, I don't have it. I wouldn't pay you even if I did. And they go, okay. And they take the 12,000 men and line them up and mass execute them. How we don't change. <laughs> We are the same people. We've never, never changed. We pretend there's all this progress. Such a lie. This outrages the army. By the way, it was about 10% of the Roman army. This is no small number of men. This is catastrophic. And it infuriates the army. The army is like, you should have found that money. You, you put us out there to fight for you. You didn't come up with the ransom to get our boys back. They vote for a guy. His name is Focus. And they, t they send him. He's a general. Uh, with a delegation to Constantinople to meet with Mauritius. Focus arrives. Mauritius refuses to meet with the delegation. He sends them packing. He sends them back. And the, the army now is turned against Mauritius. They're just waiting for a chance to hurt him. And that chance happens in 602. In 602, the army rises up against uh, Mauritius. Uh, they capture him. And they capture his family. Um, they, they bring him and his sons in. The, they missed one son, but they have all of his sons mi minus the oldest one. And they bring him into the room in the sacred palace. And uh, they, they make him watch as they execute one son after the other. And once they've wiped out all his family, then they execute him. Um, the problem, and then Focus becomes the next emperor. The problem with this is 
that the reason why he's got this great peace deal with the Persians is the Persians ended up in a civil war and he picked sides and that side won. And so the Persian emperor liked Mauritius. He felt an obligation to, to defend Mauritius. And the oldest son is racing to the Persian empire for help. And he, somewhere around Nicaea, he's captured and killed. But the thing is, he then shows up a few weeks later in the Persian Empire and says, my dad and my whole family have been massacred. Will you help me take the Roman Empire back? So we don't know what happened here. We d maybe the army got the wrong guy and executed the wrong guy thinking it was Mauritius' son, or maybe the guy who shows up in the Persian Empire is an imposter. But it doesn't matter because the Persians are like, yeah, let's go back to war with the Romans. We make so much money from that gold, you have to pay us annually. <laughs> and yes. Okay, yeah. So the Persian Empire is what is now today Iran. It actually went up into a little bit into Central Asia and included Afghanistan. And then it uh, had Iraq and Azerbaijan. And then the Roman Empire would have been, was Syria and then most of what is now Turkey and then Georgia. So the boundary roughly between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire is roughly Iraq and Syria today. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, although it it did move a little bit from time to time. In fact, Mauritius pushed it east with his peace deal with the Persians. Um, the, the Persians decide they're going to go after uh, Focus and, and restore this pretender back to the Roman Empire's, uh, to, to, to be the em new Roman emperor. And then his western territory is going to rebellion. There's a the Exarch of Africa, his name is Heraclius. He sends his son with an army to Egypt. His son's name is Heraclius, so that one's easy to remember. And Heraclius captures Egypt. So now Phocus is, ha, has a portion of the army rebelling against him. Um, he's scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. Next thing you know, Heraclius is taking his army across the Mediterranean, goes to Constantinople, captures the city, captures Phocus, executes him, and becomes a new emperor, hoping that that will stave off the Persian attack because he's, he's killed the guy that the Persians are really mad at. But the Persians realize, no, we don't have to not attack because Rome is so weak by this point because so many Romans have been killing each other that their army has been bled. And so the Persians attack. What, what ensues, it takes a couple of years for the, ar for the armies to really engage. It's not right away, but the official years are uh, 602 to 628. So it's a 26-year long war. Um, with really like the last 20 of those being really heavy fighting. That war blo bloodies both sides, and it's, it's really nasty. There's some uh, really high-level drama. The Persian, the Persian army actually arrives at Constantinople. The problem is the Bosporus is in the way. They're trying to figure out how to get across. The Avars come from the other side, and they're like, let's work together, and they're they're trying to negotiate. Finally, the Persians decide to build a, a fleet of rafts. They put their men on the rafts. They go out into the water, and the Roman navy shows up and sinks them. And, and so the Persians turn around and go back, dis, disheartened. Um, one of the Persian generals is this guy named um, Shahbar, Shahbaraz. And uh, just to give you an idea of how wild this got, he actually at one point ended up in command of three Persian armies. They end up in this bad ambush. They're wiped out. I, the other two generals that were with him are killed. All the men are, are, are killed or captured. They capture the baggage train. He had his harem with him. They capture his women. Um, in fact, the guy was in such bad shape that when everything se settled, he's like the, one of the few people to get out of the battle alive and free. He was actually naked. So here's this Persian general naked running through trying to get away from, the arm, from this disaster. And next thing you know, he's formed a new army and he goes, he captures Egypt out from the Romans, he captures Syria, he captures Palestine. The Jews go into revolt. They join the Persians. Um, and eventually, uh, he will start to gain so much power that the Persian emperor starts to wonder how loyal he is and that he might one day try to become emperor himself. And when the Persian army is moving again to go against Constantinople, the Romans intercept a letter that was sent to the number two man under Shahbaraz, uh, ordering him to execute Shahbaraz. 
And so the Romans send a delegation with the letter. And they're like, you want to look at this. You're coming to get us, but there's somebody coming to get you. So Shah Baraz looks at the orders, changes it, uh, and makes it so that it, the, instead of him being executed, it'll be his top officers. And he executes his top officers, takes his army back to Egypt. He just turns around and goes back to Egypt. And, it, and what ends up happening is instead of it being a war just between Persia and Rome, it becomes a three-way with Shah Baraz kind of ruling Syria, Palestine, and Egypt for his own purposes, waiting for the time to strike at the Persians to, get, uh, to become emperor himself. And he does eventually do it. He, the, a peace deal is made in 628 where the Persians agree to pull out uh, and give Rome back Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. He, he's reluctant to do it, but finally he agrees. He comes back. He, shortly after getting in, back to the Persian Empire, um, a group of nobles decide that they want to assassinate the Persian emperor. They do. He, they make him the new emperor. He's emperor for about two months. Then somebody kills him. And then they put, if I remember correctly, they put the daughter of the previous emperor in place, and then somebody kills her. And anyway, it's a mess. All of this is happening, that war is happening in a really interesting time to be happening. It's 602 to 628. And the reason that's interesting is because in 610, the prophet Muhammad has a visitation by the archangel Gabriel. So this ancient Roman Persian dominated world is about to have a really shocking surprise sprung on them. Um, the Prophet Muhammad will start slowly teaching first his family members and his friends, and then eventually he starts to teach other people about, this, about the message that he's getting from the Archangel Gabriel. At first, he thinks that he's being given the instructions for how to take Judaism and Christianity and merge them back together. He thinks that his religion is, a, is to be a unifying religion. But as he interacts with and deals with Christians and Jews, he realizes that, no, this is a third religion, that this is sort of the third installment, if you will. This is Judaism 3.0. Um, when, once he realizes that, he makes the Sabbath Friday, right? Because the Sabbath for the Jews was already Saturday. The Sabbath for the Christians was already Sunday. So he decides, I've got to have my own Sabbath. So he makes it Friday. And he, 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 he doesn't go for unification anymore. He pushes in a different direction. Um, having said that, the pagan population that he, that's around him, there's a Jewish population and a Christian population, but they're minorities like the Muslims are. The um, pagan population is the majority in Mecca, the city he's from. Um, they don't want him. They don't want his religion. They don't want anything to do with this. And they begin persecuting him and his followers. After about 12 years of persecution, he and his followers decide they can't do it anymore. And in 622, they do the Hijra. And they move from Mecca to another city in the Arabian Peninsula um, that we call today Medina. It was at the time called Yathrib. And um, they, basically, he had struck a deal with the people of Medina to, to let him and his followers move there, and they do. So I told you I wasn't going to go into too much detail, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this part of uh, the story, even though I, I, I really want to, just because I want to get to some of the, the, the effects of what will happen. Um, for the next 10 years, the Prophet Muhammad ends up being more of a political leader than a religious leader. He, he's basically, he will slowly evolve into the leader of Medina. Um, the, the Meccans are going to attack him with, a, with an army. He actually ends up having to fight the Meccans in uh, multiple battles. Eventually, he will conquer his hometown. And, right, he, be, he becomes sort of an Old Testament prophet, very different from you know, the Jesus figure who's clearly just confining himself to theological matters the Prophet Muhammad actually becomes a, a state leader. In 632, shortly after conquering Mecca, he dies. And that is when things are going to get really interesting. First of all, there, it's not cl he didn't handpick a successor. So he's not establishing a, a hereditary monarchy. What's supposed to happen is the Muslim community is supposed to pick their next leader. So at its, at its core, the, the process for determining who the next person will be is actually quite democratic. Now, 
it's democratic in the sense that it's the Muslim leadership of the community. It's not the whole community that's making this decision, but it's the, 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 the leaders within the community who are making it. And they have a vote, and they pick a guy named Abu Bakr to become the, the next leader of the Muslims. His, he's going to take on the title of um, Khalif. Khalif means follower. The Prophet Muhammad's title was Rasulullah, which means basically messenger of God. So his, his real title is Khalifa Rasulullah, the, the follower of the messenger of God. Um, so he's actually got a very humble title. As this, in this role, he decides that his number one priority is to unify the Arabian Peninsula. So what is today Saudi Arabia plus the Gulf states, Oman and Yemen. They had never, ever been unified. They had never been conquered by an outside force, and they had never conquered themselves. The Arabian Peninsula had always been sort of this wild, chaotic, uh, sort of raiding place where nobody, there was no central authority. In the northwestern corner, the Romans had conquered a piece. In the northeastern corner, the Persians had conquered a piece. The Persians had gotten into what is now Oman briefly. Um, there was a period of time when uh, people from what is now Ethiopia had conquered part of the Yemen, but the whole peninsula had never been ruled by a single authority. So Abu Bakr decides that's going to be his first step. In 632, he, he, he launches a series of attacks, he sends armies out, and uh, he will, within a, about a year, conquer the Arabian Peninsula for the first time in human history. He'll put it together. It takes him really just a few months. The reason he pulls it off, mostly, is a guy named Khaled ibn Walid. So I love this guy's name. Uh, Khaled means immortal, ibn means son, Walid means newborn. So he's the immortal son of the newborn. Very cool. It's an awesome name. Um, Khaled ibn Walid is the warrior's warrior. Um, in human history, there have only been two people who, who fit into his category, him, and another guy named Tahutmus III. Um, in the West, we talk about Robert E. Lee or, or Erwin Rommel, or we talk about Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar. And it's true that all four of those guys were really amazing generals and really amazing at you know, getting into a bad battle situation and, 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 and pulling it off. Khalid ibn Walid and Tahutmus III have, were never defeated. All the guys I just mentioned were defeated at one point. They, well, Alexander the Great wasn't, but Alexander the Great didn't have the kind of wins that these guys had. It's kind of going back quickly. From 610 to 632, what was the role of women? Uh, OK, that's a good question since we were talking about it. Sure. No, no, it's a, it's a really important question. Actually, it's, I'm glad you asked it. Um, so this is really strange looking back on it. But Prophet Muhammad actually is going to transform the role of women because um, in, in the Roman Empire, the Christian Roman Empire, women were not allowed to own property. They were not allowed to sign contracts. They had no divorce rights. And they, they, they could get a divorce, they just they had no right to get a divorce. So basically the husband had to be willing to let, he had to want her, the divorce. Um, <laughs> Or, or some powerful person had to arrange for it to happen. What Muhammad comes along and he says, look, I'm going to give women the right to divorce. It's easier for men to do it. He just has to say, I divorce you three times. The woman has to have a reason. But the reasons were extremely varied. For example, the, you're not producing a baby. So he's, he, he's sterile or she's sterile. We don't know, but we know one, somebody's sterile. That, that was grounds for a divorce. Incompatibility of personality. So you could just say, I, I don't like the guy. <laughs> that was grounds for a divorce. Um, he won't have sex with me enough was grounds for a divorce. He just, I want it every day, and he wants to do it once a month. It's not enough. That was grounds for a divorce. Um, so that was transformative. Another thing that the Prophet Muhammad did was he allowed women to be witnesses in law. That, had, that, didn't, that did not exist. It did exist in, in ancient Egypt, but it did not exist in Roman or Persian culture. Um, I didn't go into the details on this, but 
the, you know, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, they were all vicious towards women. They really just did not allow women's, women to have rights. And so Prophet Muhammad said women can be witnesses, however, they only count as half a man. So, you know, you need three witnesses to convict somebody of a crime or six women because it wouldn't, it wouldn't quite work. But at the time, this was revolutionary because it was zero women prior to that, right? I mean, women just did not have that right. So it was really amazing. Another thing that he, he did was he gave women uh, not only the right to own property, which was shocking and remarkable, but he actually gave women the right to have inheritance. Now, what was supposed to happen was two shares went to a boy and then one share for a girl. So if there was, you know, if, if, you, if it was a boy and a girl in a family, when the, guy di when the father died, the boy would get two-thirds and the girl would get one-third. But if there were... Um, um, two girls and a boy, it, it wasn't quite like that because it would still be two shares for the boy and then one share for the girl, one for share for the girl. If there was another boy, it would be two shares for a boy, two sh shares for the other boy, and then one and one, right? You see how that works? So it meant that boys were going to get twice what a woman was going to get, but compared to the Roman Empire where a woman was going to get nothing, this was really amazing. So in a way, this was a revolution for women's rights. Having said that, compared to what Egypt had prior to being conquered by the Roman Empire, it really wasn't much of a revolution. And, and then, of course, when we look back on it today, we're like, I can't believe you're giving women half, and they only count, right? So, you know, you just get, kind of look at it from the, the, the period of time. Um, there is no, because I know people get all stuck on the veil thing, there is no requirement that women veil in the Quran. It just does not exist. The only reference in the Quran to that is when, uh, on a, I guess it was on a trade mission, the Prophet Muhammad went to Yemen and he noticed that there were Yemenis women who would cover their mouths. They would veil their mouths basically, but they didn't necessarily cover their breasts. And he went, all right, this is a little weird. Can you cover your breasts, but you don't have to do your mouth. That's the only reference in the Quran to, um, and it was because in Yemen, the mouth was considered a sexual organ, what the breasts were not because the breasts functioned for the children, so you covered the mouth. So anyway, uh, ancient Yemen and modern Yemen are places of great curiosity. So uh, does that, is that good or you want me to go into more detail? Okay, cool. Um, so in, by 633, the Arabian Peninsula is conquered. Khalid, I'm sorry, Abu Bakr decides to do something a little strange. He orders Khalid ibn Walid to attack the Persian Empire. They've just conquered the Arabian Peninsula. And he goes, keep going, don't stop. Because he, he sent him west, they actually end, uh, sent him east, and then he changes his mind, sends him to Yemen, and then he says, you know what, keep going. Go right into the Persian Empire. At the same time, he sends several generals with armies against the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire at this point has been an actor in the Mediterranean for 1,300 years. Now, it hasn't been a superpower for all of that time. It's been a superpower for about 900 of those years. I shouldn't say superpower. It's been a power for 900 of those years. It's been a superpower for about 700 of those years, 800 of those years. So it's been around for a while. The Persian Empire, by that point, has been a full-on superpower in the region for 1,100 years when they get attacked by the Arabs. The Arabs are, are a tiny population. They're a tiny desert population. They don't have a lot of resources. Their technology is centuries behind the Persians. It's a, at least a century or two behind the Romans. So they're technologically inferior. They're numerically inferior. They're monetarily inferior. These guys have no chance against these two empires and they're attacking them both simultaneously. Like, this is the very definition of utter madness. And Abu Bakr orders it, and his, and his generals ob oblige, and they take the Arab armies, and they simultaneously attack these two ancient empires. And co combined, these two empires have been superpowers for 2,000 years. Right? People can't even imagine a world at this point without the Persian and the Roman empires. It's beyond imagination. They are as far as anybody knows, there to stay. They will be there forever. Khalid ibn Walid is the kind of general who leads from the front. Um, when he, the first battle against the Persians, he, he pulls up his army. 
the Persians line up their army. And the first thing that, this is the way Arabs like to fight. The first thing they would do is they would pick a champion. And he would go out in between the two armies, so he was close enough to the enemy army, and he would shout impromptu poetry. And the belief was that if your poetry was good enough, the other, the other side should surrender. They should, they should quit the battle. You could win the battle with poetry. Um, and the Persians, of course, didn't have that as part of their culture, so they don't send the guy back. But that's the first thing that happens, is the guy goes over and shouts poetry, impromptu poetry at the Persians. And they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Let's just get this fight on the way, uh, going. But the, what the Persians d did have was <clears throat> a similar tradition the Arabs did, having a champion go fight. And uh, Khalid ibn Walid decides he's his own champion. And the Persian general goes, well, I got to go if he's going. Right? He's got to be general against general. And so the two men meet in the, in the middle of the battlefield and they fight. And the thinking is if, the, if the ba the, that fight is heroic enough between the, the champions, you should just call it. The other side should. So there's a way to avoid battle, either through poetry or a good champion fight. And when Khalid kills the, um, the Persian general, they go ahead and have the battle anyway, and the Persians are wiped out. Khalid invaded with 15,000 men, and he wipes out somewhere around uh, 20,000 Persian soldiers with maybe just a few tens of casualties. It's an unbelievable battle because the Persians not only outnumber him, but they're better t equipped. They have more armor, more technology. He goes and fights another battle. Same, same kind of odds, 15,000 to 20,000, beats the Persians again. Goes and fights another battle. And he keeps doing this, and he keeps beating them time after time. The Persian Empire can't figure out what's going on. Um, one battle, the Persians decide they're going to set up an ambush for him. They actually buried men in the desert. It, it, where, they, where they knew the battle was going to take place. They buried men in the desert, and they just laid still. And when Khaled came out to fight his champion, the men in the desert popped up, and they attacked. And he ended up fighting, I think it was like 15 men. So it was just him against 15 men. And one of, the, uh, one of his soldiers, uh, who, who was next to him when this happens, goes, this isn't fair. And so he runs and joins Khaled, and the two men together kill the 15 men. They like wipe them out. The whole rest of the Arab army is like, uh, okay, now it's fair. Yeah, I don't know, why, weren't, why didn't 13 men go join them? But anyway, they don't. And Khalid prevails. He gets called back because there's a rebellion in, in Arabia. He comes back to Arabia, puts down the rebellion, turns around, reinvades, uh, reinvades the Persian Empire. It, by 634, he'll fight the Battle of Firaz. He's completely conquered what is today Iraq. Uh, the Persian Empire's capital was in what is now Iraq. It's a place called Tisiphon. It's actually not far from Baghdad. When he arrives at Firaz, the Persians, by this point, have been beaten in one stunning defeat after another. I want, what the Persians realized was, instead of fighting him piecemeal, they needed to just put one big army together and fight him. And so at one point, they had three 20,000-man units converging on a single point. And their goal was to then 60,000 against 15. And so what he did was he realized he was, he was in trouble if that happened. So he took his army, split it up into three pieces. So there's three 5,000 man pieces. They moved to where they thought the Persians would be, coming from three separate directions. And they were told to arrive at a specific time on a specific night. And they did it three times in a row. Like today, with precision clocks, we would have trouble pulling this off. With, with maps and GPS, we would, this would be an almost impossible thing to do. And he does it three times in a row, arrives at the same time, same place, and at a camp, wipes out the Persians all three times. He gets to Firaz, he still has about 15,000 men. He's gotten like a couple hundred reinforcements. Like, he, he doesn't have 15,000 because he's being reinforced. There are 150,000 Persians and Romans. Firaz was the border between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And by this point, the Persians and Romans realized they had better start working together. They're in trouble. And so the 150,000 Roman and Persian soldiers, I should point out that a huge number of these Romans and Persians are actually Arabs. Uh, the, for, I don't know the exact number out of the 150,000, but if I were to guess, I would, I would say it might have been as much as half. What they were is they were Christian Arabs. So this battle is going to be 
Muslim Arabs against Christian Arabs, Persians, and Romans mixed. So there's these three nations basically in this giant slugfest. They're, they're at the Euphrates River and the Persians, Romans, and Christian Arabs are on one side and Khalid ibn Walid and his 15,000 Muslims are on the other side. And the Persians, Romans, and Christian Arabs don't want to cross the river to fight him because he's right up on the river. So here's the river. So what Khalid ibn Walid does is he takes his force, which is parked here, there's a ford here, and a bridge. There was, there was a bridge over the top of a ford, so you go underneath or, or on top. And what he did was he uh, took his army and he split it up into three pieces and he put it like that and he walked away to let them cross. And so this massive army starts to cross using the ford and the bridge, they start to cross and Khalid ibn Walid waits until there's about 50,000 of his enemy across and then he attacks and he has the guys on the close to the river come with the goal of joining at the bridge the goal is to get behind the army but leave men the whole time so there'll be you know there'll be Arabs Muslim Arabs all the way across from here to here in the meantime he's going to attack straight on but he's also going to send flankers and their goal is to completely surround this 50,000 men and then compress them through constant charges. They'll pull their horses back, a charge. The 15,000 Arabs are all cavalry. And they're riding Arabians. So they're really fast, but they're not big horses. Anyway, their goal is to pull back, charge, pull back, and keep pressing them together until they're so tightly packed they can't swing their weapons. And that's what he does. And then eventually, the, this force realizes they're in trouble. They panic. They start trying to run, but they can't because they're so tightly packed, and they literally fall over. 50,000 men compressed together like that, falling over. People just instantly die. Bones break. They're scrambling to get into the river. Men are drowning. They're trampled. In an instant, uh, the, the Muslims wipe out somewhere around 50,000 men. They win the day. They win the battle outnumbered 10 to 1. They lost a couple hundred. He's unstoppable. He, Abu Bakr sends the orders. Well, I'll tell you a little story about him because he's also, right before the battle, he's like, I can't win, I know, but it's okay because I'm going to die a martyr. It's a good day. The, you know, my men are going to die martyrs. We're okay with this. But he, then he says, but God, if you're willing to give me this win, I'll go make a hajj to Mecca and pray. And um, he had been given strict orders by Abu Bakr not to do anything different, just to conquer Iraq. Go up the Euphrates River. So he knew he wouldn't have the permission to go do this, this Hajj to Mecca. So he wins the battle. He's been ordered to go back to Iraq and secure it. So what he does is he sends his men, the, his army, in the securitous path, taking you know, the longest way possible to go back. I think they were going to Hiram. They, I, I don't remember if they were going to Hiram or Tisiphon, whatever the town was. They were supposed to go back to. He told them to go, take this really long path. And then he and a handful of men just took off on horse and rode all the way across the Arabian Peninsula as fast as they could. They get to Mecca. He's, un he's disguised himself because he knows he'll be recognized. He's disguised himself. He does, a, he does the prayer. He gets on horse. He rides as fast as he can. I think it was Hiram they were going back to. And he gets to Hiram just as his army is arriving. And he gets in the line and he enters the city and pretends that he was there all along. Shortly afterwards, Abu Bakr sends a message saying, congratulations on your stunning victory over the Persians. You, you, they call, his nickname was Saif Allah, which means the sword of God. You really are the sword of God. Uh, and you were seen in Mecca. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and then he orders him, and now I want you to go ahead and go to Syria. And, and you're going to flank Syria from the north because my men in the south are kind of bogged down. So he does. Um, in the meantime, Abu Bakr is going to die. He dies uh, in 634. So all of this happened in two years. He, Abu Bakr conquers the Arabian Peninsula and then conquers Iraq and then carves off a piece of Palestine all in a two-year span of time. It's, in, it's insane. Khalid ibn Walid goes to uh, da Damascus and Abu Bakr is replaced by Umar ibn al-Khattab. Um, who he's his first cousin. 
So you, you think, okay, they're going to get along great together. They're going to be friends. They're not. Um, Omar does not like his cousin. He's jealous of him. They grew up wrestling together, but he just hates the idea that Khalid ibn Walid is this stunning, glorious victor. So um, he sends a letter demoting him, taking away his command. And Khalid ibn Walid arrives at Damascus. He puts it under siege. If I remember correctly, it's Amr ibn al-As who gets the letter. And when he, he opens it, sees that, he, that Khalid ibn Walid's been demoted. He's like, I'm not going to show him this until we capture Damascus. So he just hides the letter and waits and waits. Finally, they capture Damascus. And then Amr knows that at this point, he's getting in, himself in trouble. So he goes over and shows him the letter. Khalid's like, I'm good with this. This is fine. I'm demoted. Um, at this point, the Roman army, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the Roman general. He was an Armenian. Ah, Valens? Hmm, something like Valens, but I don't, that, for some reason that's not sounding right. The, the Roman army has decided they're going to, they've pulled men from everywhere they can, anywhere they have reserves, and they've amassed a massive army. They're going to put these Arabs down once and for all. And they send them, and they land at Antioch, and they're moving into Syria, and they're on their way. And, the, you know, the Arab generals, uh, Abu Obaida is the new Arab commander. They're, they're panicking, trying to figure out, what do we do <laughs> 150,000 Roman soldiers coming for us. And so he, Abu Waida goes to Khalid, goes, what would you do if you were in command? And Khalid said, I would abandon everything I've conquered and I would drop back to one place because I bet the Romans are hoping to fight us piecemeal. Let's fight them with everything we've got against everything they've got. And so uh, Abu Waida agrees. They, they withdraw everything. They, they, they abandon Damascus. Everything they've captured, they abandon it, and they fall back to a place called Yarmouk. <clears throat> and Yarmouk is today uh, almost in Jordan. It's in Syria. It's near the city of Dara. It's uh, really close to the Sea of Galilee. So it's actually really close to Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. Um, the Arab army falls back. That's the terrain they've picked. And the, what, one of the reasons they've picked this spot is because of the, the way the uh, ravines work. There's a big ravine here and then a smaller little ravine there. And the Arab army parks itself like that. And uh, the Romans come down and they position themselves right there. And they're going to have a six-day long battle just out in the hot sun, <laughs> standing around in your armor. Six days, they're gonna go out, big slugfest. And if I remember correctly, the Romans had 150,000 men and the Arabs had 40, so it's bad. Abu Ubaidah looks at Khalid ibn Walid and goes, I surrender my command to you. Um, we really want you to run this battle. And so Khalid takes over and he takes his cavalry and, he's, he, and his infantry and he splits it up into these support teams. I won't go into the details, but they're fascinating. He splits them up in these support teams where when something happens, then you, there's supposed to be an automatic reaction from his generals. Like he's got this really elaborate plan. He puts it into place. The first day, the Romans attack. Uh, it's just sort of a probing attack. They're just trying to figure out what the Arabs are about. Nothing really happens. The line moves a little bit, and then it moves back. On the second day, when the Romans attack, they actually cause one of the flanks. I, if I remember correctly, it was the right flank first. They, they get both flanks to cave, but they start to get the right flank to fall. And as the Arab soldiers are starting to retreat, they're heading straight back towards their camp. In, in the ancient world, women traveled with the men because, uh, first of all, you took your family with you, and then you know, the women would help with things like repairing the, the armor, or cooking and cleaning. Um, and so as they're falling back towards the camp, there's all these Arab women seeing the men running towards them, so the Arab women went and tore down the tents, grabbed the tent poles, and made a picket. They made a line with, with the tent poles, using them as spears, and began shouting insults at their men and threatening to fight their men. 
and they, they're, you know, they're calling them cowards, and they're like, you're going to die today. It's either we kill you or they kill you. But you're gonna, and it, it works, and it gets the men to turn around, and they rally, and they go back in, and they do this just day after day. And uh, finally, by day five, it becomes clear that the Romans are just not going to be there, that they just they can't do it. That despite the overwhelming numerical superiority, they can't pull it off. And uh, on day five, the um, Armenian general, whose name I still can't remember, sends a note saying, I'd like to talk terms. And Khaled says, no. And on day six, um, he attacks. And he takes all his cavalry, puts it on one flank, and he basically cuts off the Roman retreat and then uses his cavalry to smash up the line. And they wipe out the 150,000 Romans at Yarmouk. Uh, if I remember correctly, the Arabs did end up with something like 20,000, 23,000 uh, casualties. So it was a really bad day for both sides, but comparatively not too bad for the Arabs. They win, and now Jerusalem is wide open. The Jerusalem is to the south of Yar- to the southwest of Yarmouk, or south by southwest. Um, but there's no Roman forces in the area. They're done. This was it. This was the last grand stand that the Romans could throw. And it's, a, it's turned into absolute disaster. So Abu Ubaidah resumes command, command of the Arab army and marches to Jerusalem. And they surround it. And Jerusalem is v- brilliantly located. It's at a place where springs come up inside hills. So you can actually farm inside the city. You have fresh water access inside the city. But it's surrounded by really arid land. So normally a a besieging army has to actually run a water chain all the way to the Jordan River, which is miles away, and you you know just pass buckets or somehow move the water. It's really hard on an army. The Arab army is used to operating in the desert. They don't care. When an Arabian stallion is born, they won't let it drink for a week. And if it dies, it's not meant to be in the in the Arabian desert. I mean, right? This is. They, this is perfect terrain for them. They're okay with this. And there's not a big Roman army inside. The problem that the Arabs are having, though, is they don't really want to attack Jerusalem. This is a holy city. It's just weird attacking it. So they're, they want it to, they're, they're willing to besiege it. They're willing to let it run out of supplies. Um, finally, they talk to Sophronius. Sophronius is the archbishop of Jerusalem. He's the patriarch of Jerusalem. They managed to talk him into negotiating a surrender. So he goes, okay, I want, I'll surrender, but I want to surrender to Omar ibn al-Khattab. I want to surrender to the Khalif. I don't want to surrender to some general. Well, everybody knew that Khalid ibn Walid looked like his cousin, so they just dressed Khalid ibn Walid like Omar ibn al-Khattab, and they pretended. And somebody with Sophronius recognizes that that's, that's not Omar, that's his cousin, that's Khalid ibn Walid. And Sophronius is furious. He turns around, he goes, I'm not neg- going to negotiate with liars. And he walks off. And the reason they did this was they were going to have to wait weeks for Omar ibn al-Khattab to make it from the Arabian Peninsula. But they're like, all right, fine. So they, they send for him, he comes, it takes weeks. When he finally arrives, uh, Sophronius leaves the city he, and he comes out. And, you know, he's got the lectica. I, I don't know another word for it. That's, I know there's other words for it. I just don't know it. Uh, it's the big couch thing that you sit on and people carry you around. The Roman term for it is lectica. I think divan? No, that's not right. Sedan. Sedan is one of the words for it. Uh, anyway, which you drive. Isn't that weird? Like a little leftover. Um, I want to drive a lectica. Um, so he's got like this massive lectica that requires eight men to carry. And then he's got two men fanning him. Sophronius is dressed in red silk with a big hat with actual gold tassels. You know, not gold colored, actual gold. And you know, he's perfumed up. And he comes out of the city to negotiate the surrender. And they're coming up on the hills where the Arab army is. And in front of Sophronius, he sees a man on foot wearing rags, clothing that's been stitched together so many times it's just like patchwork of clothing, leading a camel, and there's a guy riding on top of the camel. And he, so Sophronius, by the way, everybody, he spoke Arabic because he was an Arab. Sophronius was a Christian Arab 
Roman citizen patriarch of Jerusalem. Right? And so it's not a problem for him to talk to these guys, but they all spoke Greek anyway, so it didn't matter. Like they, everybody was multilingual at the time. Um, so Sophronius comes up and he looks at the guy on top of the camel and goes, where's your chalif that I'm supposed to negotiate with? And the guy kind of nods to the man on the ground leading the camel. So Sophronius goes, can you tell me where the chalif is? He goes, I, I'm him. And Sophronius is baffled. He's like, dude, you're wearing rags. You're like the leader of a new empire. And you've got a camel. And there's some guy riding it. And you're leading it. And you're in rags. And, and you know, the Arab army isn't like this. They're all riding Arabian steins. The poor people rode camels. The rich guys had Arabian steins. And they've got chain mail armor. And, you know, they've been plundering. They're filthy rich. And here's their emperor. He's... Clearly, he can't even afford new pants and a new shirt. And so Sophronius goes, you're, you're the guy? And he goes, I'm Omar ibn al-Khattab. Okay, I, I'm here to surrender the city of Jerusalem to you. And Omar goes, okay, let me, let me propose something and then, then we can negotiate. You tell me how you feel. And Sophronius is like, okay. And so he's like, why don't we walk towards Jerusalem while we're... And so they, they're walking and talking. And... So, um, so Omar says, why don't we, here's the surrender terms. All the Christians keep what they own. The churches, they're going to remain churches. The land, the property, the businesses, that all remains Christian. Uh, we're not going to plunder the city. And that's it, actually. Uh, that and we don't want any of the top bureaucrats. The Roman bureaucrats have to leave. We're going to replace them with Arab bureaucrats. And Sophronius is like, wait a minute, what about plundering the city? Are... No, no, we don't do that. We're not into that. I mean, we do a little plunder, but not Jerusalem. And Sophronius goes, I don't, I don't get it. If we conquered your city, we would, you know, we'd rape the women, we'd plunder the city, we'd take a bunch of your slaves. And Omar was like, no, no, we're not doing that. No slavery, no plundering, no rape. We just want the top. They can leave, by the way, those Romans. They can leave with anything they can carry. They can take jewelry out if they want, but they can't, no carts. They just have to carry it in their hands. And Sophronius goes, ah, I, I, there's nothing to negotiate. Oh, Mark goes, one more thing. And the Jews get to keep whatever they have too. And, and Sophronius goes, there's, there's no Jews. Omar goes, I don't, I don't get it. What do you mean there's no Jews in Jerusalem? Because, yeah, we're Romans. We hate Jews. We, we just basically wipe them out. They keep revolting. They, they won't stop. They're like these crazy stone throwing. They got rags on their head throwing. So we just got rid of them. Omar goes, how could you get rid of them from their own city? He goes, well, we killed some of them, but mostly we just forced them to leave and then slaved some. So Omar goes, okay, that's not, that's not going to work. They, as they're getting closer to the city, Sophronius is guilted out of the lectica. He gets out and he starts walking. <laughs> he just, I can't, I can't do it anymore. And so he's no, no longer in the lectica. And finally, he turns to Omar and he goes, I don't, I accept, I accept the terms. That's great. But I need you to tell me why you are walking and there's some guy riding your, your camel. And, and Omar goes, well, he's my servant and we take turns because I can only afford one camel. And it was his turn. And Sophronius goes, you remind me of Jesus a little bit. This, you're, this is so weird. So they get to the gates, and Sophronius orders the gates open. And by this point, the whole Arab army is kind of following these two men. Well, three, because there's the guy on top of the camel. And, and well, there's, then there's the eight lectica bearers and the two fanners. So um, they get to the gates, and they open the gates up, and they walk in. And Omar goes, oh, so Sophronius goes, you know, I, I would, he, they've been talking about Islam a little bit. And he goes, I have a feeling this is going to be a, this is going to usher in a really wonderful period of time. Um, I want to inaugurate this with prayer. Come to my church and you pray in your Muslim style and I'll pray in my Christian style at my church. And Omar goes, no, absolutely not. Because the first place I pray in, that place will become a mosque because my followers are going to want to commemorate me coming and praying in Jerusalem. So if I pray in your church, you're going to lose it. 
we need to pick some empty place that doesn't belong to anybody. And Sophronius goes, well, we have some church land that's empty that we're not doing anything with. And Omar goes, you will lose it. So don't, we, we, when we, let's pick a pot, spot to pray in the open, an old building. I will pray my Muslim style, you'll pray your Christian style, and then know that you lost that piece of land. And Sophronius goes, we don't need it. It's okay. And today that is the mosque of Omar ibn al-Khattab. He was right. They built a mosque to commemorate the spot he prayed in. Um, then, then at that point, Omar says, Show me the, the sites. I want, I want to go to the Temple Mount. Um, and so Sophronius goes, why would you want to go there? And he goes, well, it's sacred. It's where the Temple of Solomon was. And Sophronius goes, yeah, I mean, the key word there is was. We destroyed the Temple of Solomon. And Omar goes, but as a Muslim, the place is holy. Even if you destroyed it, I still would like to see it. And so Sophronius points at this massive man-made hill, right? The Temple Mount is blocks that were built. So when the Persian Empire conquered Babylon, they freed the Jews because the Jews had been taken into slavery by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And the Persian Emperor was a man named Kurosh, Cyrus in English. And what Kurosh said, I want all the religions in my empire to worship freely. And what that means is that the state will fund temple repairs and temple construction. And so the Jews go, well, when the Babylonians defeated us and conquered Palestine and conquered Jerusalem, they tore down the Temple of Solomon. We'd like you to rebuild it then, if, you, if you're sincere. And the Persians go, yeah, of course. So when they conquer Jerusalem, they're, they're like, let's see the plans. We're going to build this for you. And so the Jews went and made a, the most amazing plans they could come up with for a temple, and they're like, here. And the Persians are like, how did they destroy this thing? Because it's a giant man-made plateau with a temple on top. And the Jews are like, yeah, they really hated us. It's not true. The original temple was this relatively small, but they're upgrading. And the Persians are like, we promised we'd build it for you. So they went to Egypt, and they hired Egyptian engineers. And so using Persian gold and Egyptian engineers and then labor from all around the empire, they built the second Temple of Solomon, which is today the Temple Mount. And when Omar looks at it, it's covered in debris. And he goes, what's the debris? And they go, to punish the Jews after we tore down the second Temple of Solomon, we, we turned it into a garbage dump. That's like three centuries, four centuries of garbage. And Omar goes, the Roman Empire is Christian, right? Yeah, the Temple Mount isn't sacred to Christians too? I would have thought, and uh, yeah, but we hate the Jews so much, we didn't care. Just... So, it says, take me there. So they walk up, and as they're walking up, there was a, a Jewish convert to Islam from Yemen. I'm trying to remember his name. Um, Omar turns to him and says, I, I don't like that there are no Jews here. You go find 80 Jewish families and bring them here to Jerusalem and give them free housing. I want Jews in Jerusalem. This doesn't make sense. They get to the top of the Temple Mount and Omar bursts into tears because he can't believe the debris on the ground. And he falls to his knees and begins clearing the debris and throwing it off the Temple Mount. And everybody's stunned. Right? Here's, here's this. He's somewhere between... An, high priest and an emperor on his knees clearing a couple of centuries worth of garbage and pretty soon the whole army, the whole Arab army is up on the, on the top of the Temple Mount pushing the garbage off. And in the process they found a rock and a chain that they were sure were part of the original temple and they preserved those and they built, Omar ordered uh, structures built to preserve the chain and the rock. So that's where the Dome of the Rock is from and the Dome of the Chain of, is from. And then eventually they built a mosque on the on the one end of the Temple Mount to, to replace the, the Temple of Solomon. They didn't put it in the same spot as the temple because they believed that that would be weird. But they wanted something up there so worshipers could go up and worship. Um, and that's how the Arabs conquered Jerusalem. Um, I don't have a lot of time left and I'm bitten off way too big of, but we knew I would do something too big. So uh, let me do two things because I want to give you guys a little bit of Q&A time. What follows the Arab conquest, the Arabs will go all the way to Spain. They, they will go all the way into what is now Pakistan. In fact, they actually had armies 
uh, right up on the border with China, and the Arabs actually sent ambassadors to go negotiate China's surrender. Um, <laughs> Right as they're in the process of negotiating, the Arabs broke out into a, a civil war that lasted five years. So the Arab army withdrew from China. But that's, that, that's to give you an idea of the potential. Had they not broken out into a civil war, they were not only on the brink of invading China, they had actually started to talk about the Chinese just preemptively surrendering. Um, they would have probably conquered the world had they not broken out into the civil war. It was 661 is when they broke out in the civil war. It lasted... Uh, five brutal years, so it was uh, bad timing. In any case, the Arab Empire is a Muslim-ruled empire with a tiny, tiny, tiny Muslim population. When it's first born, we're talking about less than 1% of the entire population is Muslim. Some, it quickly increases, that percentage increases, but you know, because pe people convert to Islam, but it's still a, a real, really small percentage of the population. Um, the way the Muslims are going to make this work is they do something really, really strange. They go to the Christians who had been running the Roman Empire, and they go to the Zoroastrians and Christians who had been running the Persian Empire. There were Christians in the Persian Empire also. And they go, look, we don't know what we're doing. We've never had an empire. We've never had a state. We've never even run ourselves. All, we own a huge chunk of the Mediterranean now, and we're suddenly going to have to figure out how to do this. We don't know what we're doing. What we want to do is we want to leave you in your positions. You keep being the administrators and the bureaucrats running the show. We'll be the very top leadership, so we'll make the final decision, but you make all the day-to-day -day stuff because we don't know what we're doing. And, and then something else happened. Remember the library burning? Well, they create the academy in Athens. It's an attempt to restart the thing. In 529, Emperor Justinian II, sorry, the first, Emperor Justinian I ordered the, the new academy shut down. Well, the scholars at the new academy realize, they, they remember what happened at the great library. They're, they're like, this is no joke. We're not going to wait until the torch-burying maniacs come and, and kill us and burn the library. They grabbed all the books they could and they ran to the port, jumped on every ship they could, they could hire and took everything they could and they landed in Syria. They hired a caravan and they went across Syria, left the Roman Empire, went to the Persian Empire and, and actually got an audience with the Persian Emperor and went, we would like to found an academy here in the, in the Persian Empire because the Christians in the Roman Empire won't let us. And the Persian emperor went, welcome. And this is actually the second time he'd had people come from the Roman Empire. Assyrians had come also. And he just took the, the, the Assyrians and these Greeks from Athens and he merged them together and he created a, his own institution. So when the Arabs conquer that, the Persians, they suddenly end up with the remnants of the academy that was inspired into coming back into existence because of the burning of the Great Library. And um, they, they go, what are these? Right? They'd seen books before, but never like that, never arrayed in shelf after shelf after shelf. And they say this is, this is the sum total of human knowledge. We, we, you know, we have the size of the earth here. The, the, the people in Alexandria had measured the earth's parallax. The earth has this weird wobble that it completes once every 26,000 years. They were taking such accurate star chart measurements that they noticed the once every 26,000 year wobble. And that, like that's in here, we have that in here. And the Arabs are like, wow, it's crazy. We'd like to learn that. <laughs> and so they not only preserve that institution, they begin a mass translation effort to put all that into Arabic so that they can start reading it. And it's an investment that's long-term. Al-Kindi is sort of the first guy who, who really does this in, en masse. He's 8th century. So the, this is 7th century when they conquer this. The next century, they're starting to translate into Arabic. Um, by the 10th century, there's a guy named Al-Farabi. So it's, it's not until the 10th century that they finally start, 300 years later, that they finally start to do their own philosophy. But the, and he's a Persian, if I don't mention that. Uh, there will be violence done to me later. Um, but he was a Persian who wrote in Arabic and in Persian. Um, but he wrote for the Arab Empire. So like if, if, you're, if you're, say, Irish, 
and you live in the United States and you write in English, people aren't going to re keep referring to you as the Irish American. They're just going to call you an American. Um, anyway, so Al Farabi, the Persian um, philosopher, is going to actually start a whole new uh, way of looking at philosophy that will be built on by subsequent guys, Ibn, si Ibn Sina and Ibn al Haysam. Ibn, just to give you an idea of what these guys achieve, um, Ibn Sina is the father of modern medicine. He's the guy who realizes that there are multiple diseases. They have disease vectors. So if you want to stop the spread of disease, you interrupt the transmission vector. So he's the guy who came up with wash your hands. Um, he's also the guy who, who realized that as things age, they gain information. So if you could go backwards in time, there would be less and less information until you got to a singular point. And he called that point necessary being. In other words, a thousand years ago, a guy invented the Big Bang Theory and singularities. Um, Ibn al is the wrote a book called The Book of Optics. He's the guy who invented the lens, eyeglasses, the prism. He's the guy who realized that uh, light traveled in waves. He, uh, he described all objects in the universe as having gravity that pulled on it, each other. Um, he's the guy who invented the scientific method 600 years before Bacon. It's not the bacon. It's Ibn al um, He wrote probably around uh, somewhere between 130 and 150 books. We have, I think, 30 today, still extant. Um, these guys really just transformed the world as we know it. Ibn Khaldun, who's um, uh, three centuries later, uh, is the father of sociology, the father of political science, the father of modern, the study of, mod of history, the modern study of history. Um, these guys transform and found the civilization that you think of today as being a uniquely European experience. And, the, and this is all possible because they had these ancient books that they could then piggyback onto and start building uh, new science on top of. Um, I know that voice. <laughs> uh, okay. So let me contrast this with one more Jerusalem experience and then I'll do the Q&A. The Crusaders are gonna conquer Jerusalem as well. When they arrive, they've, they've actually been traveling through the Middle East up until that point. They had captured several cities and every time they would capture it, they would talk the defenders into surrendering. And every time they would talk them into surrendering, they would line them up and then do mass executions. So when they get to Jerusalem, They've got the problem. They're not a desert army. They, can't, they don't know how to do a desert siege. They've got the problem of running the water from the Jordan River. And they're, they're holding out, hoping that God will intercede and help them, and God does. Um, the Genovese sent siege equipment. They didn't have any siege equipment. They didn't know how to get over the walls. So they're stuck. They actually attacked a couple of times with nothing. <laughs> and they get to the wall, and the Arabs are like, I don't, I don't know if this is moral, shooting arrows at them. <laughs> And then um, finally they get the siege equipment because God told Genoa to send siege equipment. And they, they attack the city again and they capture a piece of the outer wall. There was an inner wall and an outer wall. They capture a piece of the outer wall. And they go to the Arabs and they try to negotiate. And the Arabs are like, you know what, go to hell. We know you're just going to kill everybody after you get us to surrender. You've done it how many times? You did it at Antioch. You know, this is your pattern. We, we're not gonna surrender to you, we'll fight to the death, it's preferable. And the, era, and the Crusaders go, look, we'll make you a deal. Leave 10 at a time. That way if we betray anybody, we just kill those 10 guys. So it's not worth it to us to betray, because what's the point in killing those 10 guys? Because if, if you still have the citadel inside the city, we we'll still won't control it, so it doesn't do us any good. And they actually talk the Egyptian defenders into leaving this way. So they go 10 at a time, they just run out the city. And eventually, the last Egyptian defenders, the last 10, you've got to figure they're going to die, but they didn't. They got away. They leave, and the Crusaders go, and they close the gates. And they walk over to the Muslim quarter, and they whip out their swords, and they begin murdering everybody. Crusader accounts say that the slaughter in the Muslim quarter was so bad that there was blood flowing at knee level in the gutters. I, I have to think that has to be an exaggeration. I can't comprehend that much blood. But, you know, this is the Crusader account saying this. So there, there, there must have been some truth to it. There must have been blood in the gutter, at least. 
um, the Muslims realized that they, it was over, they were going to die, so they began running to the mosques, thinking that they could die in the act of prayer, maybe that would help their chances with God, and the crusaders would just bat, use battering rams and smash the mosque door open and murder everybody inside. And then they went to the tops of the mosques and they broke the crescent moons off and then replaced them with crosses and instantly had churches. Then they went to the Jewish quarter. And um, so this, you know, the Arabs were ruled by Muslims, but they were Jews and they were Christian Arabs. And Jerusalem was two Christian quarters, a Muslim quarter and a Jewish quarter. They go to the Jewish quarter and they begin murdering the Jews. And, the, you know, the Jews realize, okay, we've seen this story so many times. So they start running to synagogues to pray. So that, that can be their last act is prayer in a synagogue. And the crusaders don't smash the doors open. They just pile wood around the synagogues and light them on fire and burn the Jews to death inside. And the reason was is because the crusaders believed that Jews were so horrible, such horrible beings, that there was no way to cleanse and purify a synagogue and turn it into a church. Um, the crusaders actually began the crusades in 1096 by murdering 9,000 Jewish Germans living in, along the Rhine River. So you know, like, th that was their way of getting favor with Jesus before setting off to do this. Um, they then went to the two Christian quarters. And of course, at this point, the Christians in Jerusalem don't know what to expect. And the crusaders go, the clergy and the lay people who are, you know, the deacons need to step out. And so they do, and the crusaders execute them. They mass execute all the clergy and the lay people. And it's because they were the wrong kind of Christian. The great schism had just happened in 1058. These were Orthodox Christians and the Crusaders were Catholics. And then they appointed the German and French uh, priests that they had with them to be the new priests of Jerusalem. And they went, now you are all now Catholic. Um, and so I, I did this because I just sort of wanted to show the, the really stark contrast between those two events. If I had time, I would also tell you the reconquest, the Arab reconquest, but we only have 15 minutes left and I have somebody fizzling on me and I want to give you time for questions. So, so let me hand it over to you guys. Or I'll just tell you about the Arab reconquest. <laughs> That's okay. Abu Bakr and Khalid ibn Walid. When he takes over, and his cousin takes over. Omar ibn al Khattab. That dude. <laughs> and um, they have, they say everyone stay in place. In uh, Jerusalem. Yes, in, in Jerusalem. They're doing okay. it across the empire. Okay, across the empire. Why? So they're, that's how they're getting their money. Everyone stays in place, stays status quo. But why? Okay, so actually, there's ends up being kind of interesting. So when they first do this, the Quran is very specific about Jews and Christians, the status of Jews and Christians. They are to be treated as equals to Muslims because they're of the book. Now, later on, Muslims expand this to be pretty much everybody on earth. Um, they, they, even, even though, right, obviously Zoroastrians and Buddhists and Hindus don't worship the same text, but it, they, it wasn't practical to do anything but create tolerance. So the, the Arabs, by their nature, were very religiously tolerant. They didn't, they didn't force convert. They do convert economically, though. And here's what happened. And it was by accident. I don't think anybody sat down and went, wow, I know how to do this. I think they just they had a culture. They imposed the culture, and it created mass conversion. Um, the Arab empire decided, the Quran is very clear that you can't tax Muslims. So it's a little bit of a problem. You also can't charge interest. So it's really complicated trying to have a bank and a state if you're really going to try and follow the Quran. Of course, Christians didn't believe in, in charging usury either for, for how many centuries. So it's convenient to sort of just drop those pieces out of your religion. In any case, um, all Muslims are supposed to, it's one of the pillars of Islam, give alms to the poor. So the state created, the Arab empire created the world's first ever social welfare state. 
you would pay the alms automatically, everybody did, as a tax, and it was usually somewhere around 1% to 2%. It varied from year to year. And then they, the state's job was to take that money and then distribute it to the poor and uh, the needy. And that's what they did with it. They really were, at least in the beginning, I'm sure there was corruption later on, but in the beginning they were really good about this. Um, the problem is, is that money doesn't go to running the state. So how do you field the armies? How do you build roads? How do you, right? They, they were stuck. But there's no prohibition against taxing everybody else, against taxing the non-Muslims. But it, it, instead of doing a percent, they did a fixed amount, and it, was, it varied also, but it was usually somewhere between one and two ounces of gold per year. So it's, you know, if somebody came to me and said, we want you to pay $2,000 a year in taxes, I would be singing and screaming and shouting in the streets from joy, because I pay way more than that, obviously. And so anyway, it was a really relatively small amount of money. But uh, that money could be spent any way they wanted to. So it suddenly became in the best interest of the Arab Empire to be really nice to their Jewish, Christian, and Zoroastrian populations because they were the only guys who provided them with the tax revenue that they could do anything they wanted with. The Muslims gave them the tax revenue to basically feed poor people. Who cares? Let, you know, let them eat their children <laughs> the American way. Um, Would they no, no, it was just a poor tax. If you were poor, now here's but here's what happens: if you're if you're rich, you want to pay, pay the fixed one or two ounces a year, because it's going to be as a percentage of your wealth really low. But if you're poor, you want to pay the one or two percent, because you're good luck coming up with one or two ounces of gold. So they accidentally incentivized the mass conversion of the poor to becoming Muslim, but then incentivized the wealthy populations to remain Jewish and Christian and Zoroastrian. So if you go to the Middle East today, you will find that the, the indigenous Jewish population, not necessarily the European and American colonial Jews, but the Arab Jews and the Persian Jews and Turkish Jews, and the indigenous Christian populations tend to be the richest and most well-educated portions of the population. Christians in Egypt are 10% uh, of the population and there are 70% of the college graduates, right? I mean, so there's very, and that's because it, if you're wealthy, it's just easier to get into college for numerous reasons. One, you don't have to work necessarily to provide for your family. Um, but also there's just sort of a legacy of that, por that portion of population um, being better educated. 200 years ago when Muhammad Ali created the new Egyptian state, he sort of carved it out of the Ottoman Empire, he put an ad in the paper and it basically said, if you can read this, please show up for a government job. We need bureaucrats desperately. And you know, next thing he knows, there's a bunch of Christians going, hey, where's that job? And he's like, but you're all Christian. You know, we're the only people who can read. Is that a problem? <laughs> so that it ended up that the Christian population in Egypt ended up being the bureaucrats, which what didn't work really well for the Christians because then anything that went wrong government-wise got blamed on the Christians. Right? So it's sort of a double-edged sword. Um, but there have only been a few empires that have had like a, a pattern of tolerance. Alexander the Great's brief empire, I guess it wasn't that brief because once he died, his generals carved it up, and their empires kind of follow this. That was a very tolerant empire. The empire before that, the Persian Empire, which ended up getting conquered by Alexander the Great, but then gaining its independence again and going again, that was also an extremely tolerant empire. And then the Arab Empire was very tolerant. Uh, the Mongols kind of ended up tolerant, but they started off vicious, murderous. So you, you, can't, you can't put them in that category. They don't, that doesn't work. They killed like 30 million people before they went, hey, let's, that's pretty tolerant. Yeah, it's, it's kind of bad. <laughs> you know, like they wipe out the city of Baghdad, which at the time was the largest city on earth. There was a million people, and they kill 800,000. They lined everybody up and cut their heads off. It's like, just the effort. <laughs> like, you couldn't have thought of something better to do? Knitting, uh, tanning hides. Um, 
so, the, so you know, there's, there's the Persians, the Hellenistic period under Alexander and his generals, the Arabs, and then pretty much all the other empires in human history have had really a powerful edge of intolerance to them. Um, the Roman Empire was extremely intolerant. I mean, the myth, the myths that we created about the Roman Empire was that they were tolerant. They, they were tolerant in some sense towards uh, pagan religions. So, but even then it was kind of vague. So like they allowed the Egyptian pagans to continue to be Egyptian pagans, but they hated it when the Egyptian gods would show up in, in, in the city of Rome. Like the, as the Isis cult spread throughout the empire, the Romans were like, what can we do to combat this? This is horrible. <laughs> they need to be worshiping um, Venus and, and Diana. And, not this. Um, so one of the tragedies of history is, has been that usually, if you look at the historical record, usually if there's a tolerant empire, there is a counter intolerant empire and the two are clashing. And inevitably, in every single case, I have yet to find an example that this isn't true, the tolerant empire eventually becomes just as intolerant as the empire it's fighting. Intolerance wins is the answer, which is so painful. And the, the Arabs never became intolerant. They collapsed. Their empire just went poof. But I'm sure if they had hung out long enough, they would have eventually kind of adopted. I mean, you can see the intolerance today. There's just no Arab empire to go with it. Um, you know, like if you travel in Egypt and you don't look Egyptian, you're going to just get blasted with Yahawaga, which means foreigner. It's like, yeah, I know, that's great. Let's move on. You don't have to keep reminding me, you know. So there's, it, it's, it ultimately got there, but it wasn't there originally. The Crusades are one of the periods of history I feel very like, weak in my knowledge of. Okay. Um, but it's one of those things that's referenced a lot. Do you have a recommended book or resource about the Crusade, that period of history particularly? Um, I feel like everything I've I have read or known about that is really dated and old. I'm trying to remember the author. There's a book called The Crusades Through Arab Eyes. Uh, it's a pretty solid read. There's also S Sir John Bagot Glub Basha. <laughs> um, just, you could just do uh, Glub, G-L-U-B-B. Um, he was a British officer who, who became an Arabophile uh, and went native. When the British Empire withdrew from Transjordan, which is today Jordan, he stayed and became an officer in the Transjordanian army. He wrote, he wrote a brief history of the Arab people there are a, a book on the early, early years, but I think he also wrote something on Crusades. I could be wrong about that. I might be mixing it up with somebody else. Um, but he's a good read just to get general Arab background stuff. Um, there's Albert Urani. Um, I hate saying his name like he's French, but I just feel like I have to. Uh, Albert Hurani. <laughs> um, he, he wrote a, a really wonderful book on Arab history. It starts off chronologically, and then he dumps the chronolo chronological stuff and just sort of starts talking about it more culturally. Um, but you, you want the Crusades in a three-minute nutshell? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that'd be awesome, but I was just thinking if I wanted to dig into this on my own some Yeah, the, 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 I can maybe come up with more of a list. Offhand, I can't, I can't think of any other good books on it. It's really hard finding stuff on yeah. the Crusades. It, there, Anything where I mean, everybody European men them, aren't, you know? aren't the good guys or aren't doing really well suddenly gets, yeah. no, oh, I can't know. find anything. <laughs> yeah, once, <laughs> one, oh, crimes against humanity by white guys. No, 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 shh. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> um, there were, <laughs> there were, now, I don't know if this is true, but a student who's a film student told me that the original screenplay for... Um, Kingdom of Heaven had no good crusaders in it. And when Hollywood got a hold of this, uh, is this true? Do you know? No, it sounds true. It, when, when Hollywood got a hold of it, they created Jeremy Irons' character. So Jeremy Irons' character ha is not a historical character. They just made him up so they could have one good crusader. And then they rewrote. Um, He's always the tolerant Christian. Yeah, he always, always. Yeah, always. Mission, he was so oh, wonderful. Always. I love that guy. Um, they, they rewrote Ibeline of Balian's role, and they, you know, they, he's like some random guy who gets sort of pulled off. He was born in Palestine. He was like 
a second generation crusader. Like, he wasn't some random blacksmith in Germany somewhere. And you know, like he, they have him accidentally have this love affair with, I can't remember, Ava Green is the actress, I can't remember the name of the, the, the person she's playing. But that actually happened because he was plotting with her to get rid of <laughs> the king. You know, like it, it, they made it innocent when the reality is they're just backstabbing bastards all. And you know, they did, they did try to show, the funniest scene ever in that movie is everybody's like kind of starving and it's desert. And Ibeline, who's played by Legolas, uh, <laughs> that's his best role ever. Uh, he should have never played any other role, just Legolas. Um, he suddenly goes and gets a shovel and starts digging a hole. The Arabs invented modern agriculture. They're the guys who figured out crop rotation. They're the guys who created the sugar industry, the coffee industry. They're the first country on earth to pack a ship full of ice and then put fresh food in it and send it overseas to another country. They're the, they're the guys who hybridized pl plants, who built the world's first irrigation dams. They're the guys who invented hydraulic pumps so you could pump water out to far off places. I mean, he, he taught them to build a well like it's the most absurd scene ever. Like I burst out laughing and of course people in the theater are like, why is he laughing? That's not funny. <laughs> White guy showing brown people how to do things. Um, that's wonderful. See how good we are. So there were, there were four, there, were, there was probably nine or ten officially dated or officially numbered crusades. The first three got to the Middle East. The fourth one conquered Constantinople, which I think is hysterical. The first one is the one who cap that captures Jerusalem. Uh, they, it takes them two years to get to Jerusalem and then they capture it a year later. Um, the second one is a reinforcement crusade. It's just to send reinforcements. And the third one is to recapture Jerusalem because they lost it. Um, the reason they lose it is what the story of the movie, Kingdom of Heaven, is about. Actually, when I left the movie theater, I turned to a friend and I went, okay, I can't wait for the movie that shows Nazis as good guys. And sure enough, Downfall <laughs> came out of, uh, like a year or two later. And Downfall is about the last month in um, Nazi Germany. It's about April of 1945. And there is a character who is a SS doctor who's clearly a good guy, but he's also SS. And ironically enough, the actor who plays him is Jewish. Uh, so, and, and, and this movie is set in Russia because it's, St. Petersburg is the last large German architecture built city that's still intact because it didn't get bombed out of existence in World War II. Um, the, what happens in the movie, of course, is the, 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 the kind of crazy crusaders, because they had crazy crusaders and not crazy crusaders, which is weird. It'd be like crazy ISIL and not crazy ISIL. Uh, I just, that's, it doesn't make sense. The crazy crusaders in the movie will keep wanting, and they're the Knights Templar, because they're always portrayed as being over the top crazy. Um, they, they, they keep trying to pick a fight with the Arabs, which actually was happening. They, they kept doing it. And finally, they did actually capture Salahuddin's sister, and they gang raped her and murdered her. And Salahuddin went, fine, I'm killing you. <laughs> you. You got me going. Thanks for doing that to my sister. Um, and he, he beats them at the Battle of Hatton in 1187. And the irony of this is the, his ar Arab armies were democratic. And so even though Salahuddin is in charge, he's the general in charge, he still has to deal with what his soldiers vote for. And they, after the battle, they've got all these crusader prisoners, they vote to kill all of them. And Salahuddin goes, no, that's not us, that's them. We will never be them, right? The tolerance intolerance thing. That's what they would do to us now. And we don't do that. And uh, the, the soldiers are like, we don't care. We've been fighting these crusaders for almost 100 years now. Uh, 90 years, we're sick of them, we have to punish them, we have to hurt them. And um, he goes, has to negotiate with his own army, and they go back and forth. Here's what they come up with. They, they will only kill, they will only execute the Knights Templars and the Knights Hospitallers, who were the fanatic uh, warrior monks who took vows of chastity and poverty and were extremely filthy rich and founded the banks in Switzerland. Um, <laughs> Maybe. 
I don't really know. I just, right, this is the story that okay. seems to be, it could be, yeah. Some people, think. some people think, and some people think they became the bankers of Switzerland. Some people think they became the masons of Scotland. The, the, the <laughs> truth is in there somewhere. Um, so uh, they line up the Templars and the Hospitallers for execution, and Saladin still doesn't want to do this. So he has guys who speak Latin, Arabs who speak Latin walk up and down the lines going, hey, we can't execute Muslims. We can't execute Muslims. <laughs> wink, wink, wink. <laughs> and so when the guys, when the crusaders, the Templars and hospitals would get to the executioner, they would immediately convert on the spot. And they're, all right, fine. And they put them into the Mamluk armies, which were these slave armies. So they got turned into slave warriors, but they didn't get executed. And we think, we don't really know, but we think about three quarters of the Templars and Hospitals converted that day. <laughs> the weird thing was, there were a bunch of Crusaders who weren't Templars or Hospitals who started volunteering that they were. And so maybe another 10% the number of Hospitals and Templars who were scheduled for execution who didn't get executed end up showing up and they're like, we're Templars. And the Arabs are like, you don't get it, right? That's not a food line. <laughs> <laughs> that ends badly at the end. You don't want to get in this line. And they're like, no, we do, because if we die this way, we'll go straight to heaven. And they actually lied about who they were so that they could be martyred like this. Um, then Salahadin went to Jerusalem, and, and of course, Ibelin of Balian ends up in command of the defenses of Jerusalem. And he's, you know, hunkered down and trying to hold the city. And the, uh, the Arabs keep attacking and they, they're having a hard time getting it. And finally, uh, they create a breach in the wall, which is depicted in the movie. And then Salahadin and Abilene of Balian get together and they negotiate a, a surrender. And um, again, Salahadin is stuck negotiating with his men. He's like, they want to enslave every, all the crusaders. They want to take all of them into slavery. He's like, oh, again, that's not us, that's them. You know, this isn't okay. They negotiate back and forth. Finally, they come up with, I, I forget the number, but they came up with something like a quarter of them will be enslaved. But if they have the money, they can buy their freedom. So Salahuddin goes, okay, so this is the deal. We're going to enslave 20% of you, a quarter of you, whatever the number was. But if you have the money, we can free you. You can buy your freedom. And Eveline's like, okay, that's, thanks. We surrender. And Salahuddin goes, no, no, no. I'm going to give you guys 48 hours to sort this out. And Ibelin goes, what's the point? We'll surrender right now. Because if you have the gold, you can buy your freedom. And Ibelin's like, I, I don't get it. <sighs> Plunder the city. Plunder your own city so that you can free your crusaders. So he has to explain it to him. So that's not the movie. He plunders Jerusalem in the 48 hours he has. They come out, they, they put the gold out, and they count it up, and they don't have enough. They have like enough to do half of the crusaders that are going to be enslaved. The other half are still going to have to be enslaved. And so Hadin goes, that's it? That's all the gold? You've been here for almost a century, and this is all you've accumulated? You guys are incompetent. We should have conquered you a long time ago. And then he, so Hadin walks off. He goes into his own tent, pulls out his own coffer, his own gold chest, walks over and drops it and goes, Add this to frame these dumbasses. <laughs> and when this happens, uh, the, his, a bunch of his generals are like, all right. And they go empty their own coffers. And by the time they're done, they end up enslaving like 5% of the crusaders. But you know, after Saladin bankrupts himself. And, and this, is, this is how they cut. So you know, like the, the stark contrast of fighting their anger for the abuse that they had but they, and still trying to be human and get through this somehow. Um, I, I find really fascinating because you can see the intolerance seeping in and the anger seeping in. And then, of course, the Crusades don't get, quit. This isn't the end. They, the Crusader states will function in some way, shape, or form for the next 104 years. Um, they finally fizzle. Every historian gives you a slightly different date, but somewhere around 1291. Having said that, there's an organization that's an observer member of the United Nations. They have the, almost the same status that the Palestinians have. It's just observer status. They're not voting members. It's called Sovereign Military Order of Malta. 
It's not Malta. That's a different thing. There's a Republic of Malta. This is the sovereign military order of Malta. It's the Crusaders. The Crusaders actually have UN observer status. They're st and they're still around. And they're, they're still banking on getting Jerusalem someday. Uh, so in case you're wondering where they went. <laughs> I wonder how you become one. Like, do you... Use <laughs> like, do you... I'm sure it's through the Catholic Church somehow. There's, there's got to be, but I just, like, I, I'd like to volunteer. And then do you get a salary? <laughs> this could be an interesting gig. You obviously have to have some kind of military training or experience. Um, and then the rest of the Crusades were, the, like, the Baltic states, which, why? And then there was one to Malta. And Malta, Malta, you, know, you go there, they speak Arabic, but they write in Latin letters and they're all fanatic Catholics. And, you know, their, their flag is a cross. But the language they're speaking is Arabic with hints of Italian mixed in there, but it's really just Arabic. And so it's sort of a strange place because it's got this strange crusader history. But anyway, I've gone over by five minutes, so, you know. Any more questions? You said you were going to ask me yeah. one. Well, no, I just had to, um, I just want to know what your opinion was if you thought the Arabs were like the last classical empire. Oh, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know because there's, I think, I bet if you sat down and did this, I, I haven't done this, but I'm just guessing, every empire sort of evolves as it goes. In the sense of classical as in the tolerant brand, yeah. Right, I mean, when you think of the Spanish Empire, they're just brutal murderers. You know, the 16th century was the worst century in human history for death, human inflicted death toll. The 20th century is number two. That's how bad that was. So, you know, the British Empire for all its, its you know, we're good guys kind of stuff, it turns out to have been quite ugly. Like, for years, the Brits have said we were not cruel during the, the Kenyan uprising. The Mau Mau, and you know now because of freedom of information stuff, uh, it's turned out that they were torturing people, disappearing people, raping people, you know. So the the, the idea of the good empire the, the Brits supposedly had that's that sort of burst that bubble sort of burst. Um, I think the Mongols wanted to be, but they're just so over the top cruel. They were so cruel that they would look for ways to be cruel. Like they were, at, at one point they captured a Persian town and they're like, oh, what do we do? Do we, it's so boring cutting people's heads off. So what they decided to do is they got cement and they, they made people lay down and they cemented them together and they made a fort with parapets and, and arrow slits. And of course the people on the bottom are crushed to death and the people on the top die from exposure. He just, why? They just, so it's, so even though they tried really hard to be that, I, I think maybe they're the switch. Maybe the Mongols are the inauguration of our, because modernity is vicious. It's absolutely cruel. There's no, you know, World War II, we bomb Europe and US bombs Europe and Japan for no reason, really. The, the bombing campaign against the oil targets in Indonesia and in Romania made tons of sense, or even the oil targets in Germany where they had refineries. But anything beyond that was just pure sadistic cruelty. So even the good guys in World War II were actually sadistic evil bastards. And so I, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Cause I, you made me think about it. I can't think of it. The French maybe in, not, not in Asia and Africa, but the French in uh, Canada maybe hint, a hint of that because of their tolerant policies towards the Native Americans. Um, yeah, okay, I'll go with that. Last well, uh, what do you think happened to the caliph when, the cat, when he got captured by the Mongols? Because I've heard two stories like that they sealed him in a tower and bricked it up. Okay, I've never heard that. Or they wrapped him in a, in a carpet. carpet. Yeah, the, that's the normal. The wrapping yeah, because... Uh, a ruler is, a, is sacred, because they were originally animus, and you couldn't let the blood of a ruler hit the ground, because it was sacred, it, would, it was a waste. So what they did was they rolled them into a carpet and then had horses trample them to death. Um, never heard the tower one. But that, that would fit, because then they're not spilling his blood. 
the king of Afghanistan, I guess he was, was he the Ghaznavid? I think he was the Ghaznavid ruler. They married him. They got one of the, one of the Mongol generals. They shaved him uh, so that he had no body hair and they put him in a woman's wedding gown and they had one of their generals marry him and left him as the, as the king. That way there could be no other king, but they completely effeminized him so that nobody would ever follow his, his edicts. Because <laughs> you know there was a honeymoon. Because <laughs> they were the Mongols. Arabs love Alexander the Great. They, they look at him as like this amazing hero, um, which is the Persians do too, which is really weird because he smashed Persia. You would think they would hate him, but like Iskander is a common name throughout the Middle East. Uh, he's revered as, as a, having been a really cool guy by pretty much everybody. Um, I, I think of him as just a crazy megalomaniac, but he wasn't vicious at least. You know what I mean? Just so what he thought he was the son of Zeus. You know, everybody has their quirk. <laughs> All right, I've gone way past now. Thanks so much. You guys ask great questions.